chance to introduce Holly Wade again, who is from NFIB, and uh, I turn the program over to Holly. Thank you, Holly, for joining us today. We appreciate your support. Great, thank you. Uh, it's nice to be with you all. I certainly appreciate how difficult it is out there. Um, you know, struggling with how to adjust business operations, how to deal with closures of some businesses and throughout the country with all the different orders in place um, requiring shutdown, temporary shutdown. Um, this National Federation of Independent Business is the largest small business advocacy association in the country. And we have heard from many small business owners um, throughout the last few weeks about how difficult it's been to manage business operations, whether it's dealing with employees who are nervous about the outbreak, sick employees, how to navigate some of the mandates that are required of small business owners, um, and then also trying to navigate the two most popular small business targeted loan programs that are currently available, um, but have had some uh, roadblocks or uh, you know, not as smooth as we would like as far as rollout. Um, so I'll go through some of the two main loan programs and uh, qualifications to participate in the loan programs. Um, what can you expect? as far as uh, eligible uh, expenses in these loan programs. And we can walk through some of these together. So let me start by seeing if I can the slide here. Um, uh, just a disclaimer that the information provided is, uh, is the information that is most current and as best we understand it. It's certainly a fluid process in the rollout of these loan programs. So parameters are changing all the time. Um, and so we're you know, staying up to date, but this is the most current information available. So starting at the beginning, there has been a lot of legislation over the past few weeks um, focused and targeted on the outbreak and, and, and offering support and assistance to deal with uh, different populations within the country. Um, the phase one legislation was enacted March 6, 2020, and it included, as it pertains to small businesses, it included the expansion of the economic injury disaster loan. So they, they rolled out that the coronavirus pandemic would in, be included in the EIDL loan program and that business or that states had to certify that they were uh, economically impacted so that small business owners could participate in accessing the EIDL loan program. Um, it was a bit of a slow rollout for states to certify themselves to be eligible participants in this loan program. Um, not too long after though, there was a, a blanket recognition that all states would be eligible for this program and those small business owners in those states to be eligible. They increased the volume of financing to fund this program. And so it expanded uh, to $7 billion uh, to help promote this program and support it for those seeking assistance. The phase two program or phase two um, legislation, I'm sorry, was enacted uh, about 12 days later, March 18th. That included the emergency paid sick leave that is mandatory for those businesses under 500 employees that they are mandated to pay 10 days of paid sick leave related to the coronavirus. They expanded also the FMLA provision that it, uh, broadened that to 12 weeks paid FMLA uh, for childcare for employees who had childcare related issues as far as school shutdowns that were um, instituted because of the outbreak. 
but it also included a bit of support for those small business owners who um, who were paying for this added sick leave in a refundable tax credit that they could apply for and, and withhold uh, payroll taxes up to the amount that they were paying in sick leave. So they included that provision to defray the costs. Um, but that again caused um, some paperwork and and uh, uh, compliance burden on small business owners, but they are able to get a refundable tax credit for that paid sick leave mandate. And then there is a hardship exemption for those small businesses with less than 50 employees if they cannot um, if they cannot meet the the requirements under the paid sick leave. The phase three uh, legislation that was enacted March 27th focused uh, primarily for um, those provisions that were specific to small business on the new paycheck protection program loans. And we will go through that. It also delayed payroll tax payments. Um, but the main program that was attracted, attractive for small business owner was this you know, new loan program that we will go through. So we'll go through the, the three um, main small business loan provisions. One is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, the EIDL. That is attached to the Emergency EIDL Grant. And then third, we'll go over the Paycheck Protection Program loan that was just rolled out last Friday, April 3rd. So looking at the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, this loan program that was expanded to include disruptions of COVID-19 um, for small business owners is a program that is facilitated through the Small Business Administration. So you go, you apply through the Small Business Administration. They have an application online that you fill out and submit. This program allows for a working capital loan up to $2 million. The interest rate is fixed for those borrowers at 3.75%. And, er, uh, and for nonprofits, it is, um, it is fixed at 2.75% for interest rates on those loans. Uh, loans that are smaller than 200,000 can be approved without a personal guarantee. And there is no collateral requirement now for these loans as there was for previous EIDL loans. There's no early repayment penalty and the loan term is 30 years for these loans. So there's a 30 year term for them um, and, and up to $2 million. The eligible expenses for the EIDL program are payroll costs, including benefits. So health insurance, retirement are included in payroll costs of fixed debts, so mortgages, rents, leases, that were in place before the outbreak. So the terms of this program are or January 30th is when the program began. So you've had to have fixed costs um, that were already established to pay for, or to use the loan for, uh, for debts. Um, it also can go towards account payable and other related bills. And so the, the eligible expenses for this um, differ from the new PPPL program. We'll do a side by side so that it's a bit more clear and uh, it'll offer some, um, some comparison so you can make the best decisions on what loan program, if you're interested, might be best for your situation. The, the um, CARES Act also included this emergency advance EIDL grant. And you've probably heard of this. It is 
attached to the application of the EIDL loan. So those who apply for the EIDL loan can click a box asking, to, asking for the up to $10,000 emergency advance that is entirely forgivable. So this 10,000 emergency advance is essentially a grant and you are able to access this, um, this advance regardless if you're accepted or declined or denied the loan itself. So while it is attached in practice where you have to apply for the loan to receive the $10,000 emergency advance grant, um, you get that regardless of if you actually get the loan itself. So now moving on to the SBA Paycheck Protection Program. This is the new program that was rolled out April 3rd on Friday that has made a lot of news about the bumpy rollout. And this loan is for businesses with less than 500 employees, independently owned franchises with less than 500 employees per location, Accommodation and food service. So if you're in the next of, I believe it's 72, um, it is 500 employees or less per location. And then it also includes sole proprietors, independent contractors, the self-employed individuals. And just to um, go back, sorry, uh, backtracking a little bit, with the EIDL loan, that was also expanded for those businesses under 500 employees that also include sole proprietors, independent contractors, and the self-employed. So they've broadened the scope of who's eligible for both loans. And you can, so most small business owners can access both of these programs. The EIDL program is also available to all nonprofit organizations. So if you're a 501c7, a c6, a c3, the EIDL loan program is available to you. The PPPL program is only available to nonprofits that are 501c3s. So that's a bit of a difference as far as eligibility for these two loan programs. This loan program, the new loan program, is only available for those that are 501c3 nonprofits. And also with this program, you have had to have been in business since February 15th, 2020. So you can be a seasonal business, certainly, but you have had to have been in business since February 15th and paid taxes on your employees or independent contractors um, prior to that date to be eligible for the program. Um, I just looked this up. So the size standards for eligibility, it is under 500 employees, and, but it can also include those over 500 employees if you meet the SBA size standard eligibility for the loans, for SBA loans. And for golf courses and country clubs, this business size standard is 16,500,000 in annual revenues. So I did wanna put that out there in case there are some of you who are over 500 employees, but meet this, new, this threshold for the business, small business size standard, where you would still be eligible to access the loan program. So for those who are looking to, for this program, um, the max amount that you can borrow from this program is two and a half times average monthly payroll for the previous year, up to $10 million. So there was a bit of confusion early on whether that meant the 12 months prior to when you applied for the loan, or if it was 2019 average monthly payroll. So it appears that the banks are choosing one or the other. So it is good to have your payroll costs 
all the way through 2019. They might ask for the 12 months prior to when you're applying for the loan. They might ask for 2019. If they're asking for, um, for uh, tax filings, they can ask for you know, the most uh, recent that you have filed. So that might actually be 2018 as far as um, paperwork that might be necessary uh, for the banks, but for payroll purposes, it's two and a half times month average monthly payroll through the previous year up to $10 million. Um, for seasonal employers, the average total employees is calculated for the period between February 15th and June 30th of 2019. Since that is the window of this program, they're looking back at the same window last year as far as payroll. So I wanted to put that out there since I'm sure many, many of you um, are seasonal. Um, and so that's the calculation for average total employee uh, payroll costs for seasonal uh, businesses. There is an affiliation test um, on the application where you have to show 50 or you have to, if there's a 50% equity ownership, um, common management of CEO, board, or similar, identifying of, in, identify of interest between close relatives, stock options, convertible securities, and other arrangements. Those will have to be listed in the application. Um, it, it's pretty clear walking through. There's also um, information, well, this would be information that would be required from the bank. Um, and then there's also 20% uh, ownership or more that you have to list anybody that has 20% or more ownership in the business. And that part's on the application. So, you know, up to you wouldn't have more than five uh, owners of a business with 20% more um, ownership, but you have to list all of those people on the application. Um, the application process, um, basic business identification information, again, a list of owners of the applicant with 20% or greater ownership stake, a list of any businesses under common ownership or management, uh, details of any EIDL received by the business between January um, 1st, and I actually... I think that might be a typo because I believe it's January 30th, uh, 2020, um, that you would have to show that you've received an EIDL uh, loan. If you've applied for an EIDL loan and you want to apply for this, but you haven't received um, approval yet for the EIDL, I don't believe you have to check that box until you're actually approved for the loan. Because I know many people are, are applying for both loans and you can do that. I'll go through some of the conditions for applying for both loans, um, but you will have to check the box if you've already received financing from the EIDL loan if you're applying for this new PPPL loan. And then information about the individual applicants and good faith certification by a business representative or business owners. So, and the applicants must submit payroll documentation and things like that that's asked for by the bank. Um, the application has a number of good faith certifications that um, that they're requiring the borrower to check and this is to streamline processing so that the bank isn't overwhelmed with checking all of the information received by the borrower they're trying to expedite payment of or processing of these loans and getting the money to the borrower as quickly as possible that certainly um, hit a few bottlenecks and roadblocks over the last few days um, but the good faith certification element to this is um, was designed to help in that uh, facility facilitation of the loan. And then the application, again, the application process, good faith certification um, is included. 
So what are the terms of these loans? So the terms of these loans, it's a bit confusing because it's changed over the last few weeks. Um, the law says up to 4% interest rate or between six months up to a year for loan deferment. And it was up to a 10 year loan maturity. So a couple days ago, the Treasury um, posted guidance on these parameters and they are um, now, I, I think, I hope, final as far as what borrowers can expect and banks can expect. And so the latest guidance is that the loan payments can be deferred for six months after the origination of the loan. Interest will be accruing throughout this six month time frame, So that is included, but there is a deferment for six months. Uh, the interest rate was up to 4% in the law. And initially it had been understood that it would be half a percent for the interest rate, but they have finalized it at 1%. So all borrowers, every borrower taking out a PPPL loan, will the loan will be at a 1% interest rate. The loan maturity is now um, at two years. So it is a two year, 1% loan uh, for all loans. The loan is 100% guaranteed by the SBA and it requires no collateral or personal guarantee for these loans. So those requirements have been waived. And they're again, um, as with the uh, EIDL loan, there is no prepayment penalty for this loan. So you can, you know, if there are funds that you aren't going to use, you can prepay back the loan to the bank and then you'd be done. You don't have, there isn't a penalty associated with that. And then what can you use the loan on? So this has been um, a, a bit of concern, um, confusion as far as qualifying payroll expenses. And the latest guidance from Treasury in order to um, uh, kind of direct people to the vision of this loan program, 75% of the loan is required to pay for payroll expenses. So that includes wages, salaries, um, insurance benefits, retirement benefits that are paid for by the applicant. So for insurance costs, it's what the, the employer or the applicant pays for as far as health insurance costs, not the, the um, employee share of responsibility for paying for health insurance, but on the owner side. Um, so all of those are included in payroll uh, costs. And then 25% of the loan can be used for rents, utilities, and mortgage interest. So not the principal on the mortgage, but mortgage interest, um, but also rents and utilities. And the loan can be used for expenses. Um, and this actually, sorry, this is a bit updated. Loans can be used for expenses incur that st had started um, before February 15th. So for instance, rents, utilities, all of those uh, expenses had to be in place before February 15th to use the loan for those expenses. Um, also, so when you receive the loan going forward, the loan is for, there's an eight week um, window to use expenses that qualify as forgivable expenses. And then anything after that you can use for the two year term of the loan. Um, so again, the. Uh, expenses that are covered by loan forgiveness. So this is the eight week period for loan forgiveness, the cover period in which the expenses can be forgiven up to eight weeks for eight weeks from the date of loan origination. 
So once you receive the, the loan um, and, and uh, the date of origination, you have eight weeks to spend the loan money for those forgivable qualifying expenses. And those forgivable qualifying expenses, again, include payroll costs, payment on interest of debt um, mortgage obligations, rent and utilities. And it, within the forgivable expenses, it still has to be the 75-25% split. So 75% have to go towards payroll costs and 25% can be used for other expenses. Um, but you have an eight week window to use the, the loan and to have that be forgiven um, with the following uh, forgivable expenses. At the end of the eight weeks, um, then you submit another application, then there's another process of submitting paperwork for the bank then to verify that these are forgivable expenses. You, um, you know, you checked all the boxes as far as uh, qualifying for the forgiveness program. And, and so then that process will take place. But it is important to keep all paperwork in order for these qualifying expenses. So when you go back to your bank, they can process it quickly and there isn't any ambiguity about what expenses were paid for in that eight week window and making sure that it is within the eight week window um, that you're using those, uh, that loan. Where can you apply for these loans? So this is a bit of the tricky part that has been um, part of the frustration with the rollout, any lending institution that is participating in the loan program. And so this is not facilitated through the SBA. The SBA is, um, is the 100% guaran uh, guaranteeing these loans, but borrowers um, apply for these loans at your local bank. So we are suggesting that those interested in this loan program first check the bank that they currently bank with for business purposes and ask if they're participating in this loan program. Um, there are a number of banks that are participating and but however, we have found that most banks are only uh, facilitating applications or taking applications from current customers. So right now, many banks are only taking applications from current customers. That's why it's important to check with your bank first to see if they're participating or if they're planning to participate in the near future. Um, Congress is planning to allocate more money to this program, uh, $200 billion more to the program. There was a bit of uh, concern that with the demand for this program, they would run out of money quickly. And so to help ease those concerns, um, Congress is going back to allocate more money for this program. Um, banks are, are starting to participate in this program um, kind of in different time frames. So, for instance, Bank of America is currently participating. Wells Fargo, you may have seen the news that they started participating. They hit the cap for the amount of loans that they could service and they had to shut down the program. But um, the feds have lifted that cap. So they're able to facilitate loans now starting today. And, but there are other may, uh, larger banks, for instance, Citi, um, they haven't started processing these loans. So their program is still being developed and they should be online soon if there are any city customers out there. Um, but, and more and more local uh, community banks are starting to uh, facilitate these loans. So participation is increasing, thankfully, um, so that hopefully most small business owners who are interested in this program uh, will have have an opportunity to uh, apply for this loan. So on the NFIB site, we do have this side-by-side uh, -side comparison of the two loan programs um, that show the 
um, different categories of the loan program, the lender, again, the EIDL, is facilitated through the SBA. The PPPL is facilitated through commercial banks. Um, as far as the PPPL, I know that there is a lot of discussion about broadening um, the, the parameter of who can facilitate these loans beyond commercial banks. And so maybe some of the fintechs or PayPals might be able to participate. And that's still um, being determined and, and coming out with guidance for those type of financial institutions. But now all banks, all commercial banks can um, participate in the program. Um, so they did broaden that. Um, the program period uh, the, for the EIDL loan, it's through December 31st. Um, the program period for the Paychecks Protection Program is June 30th. So for the PPPL program, you have to apply by June 30th to participate in the program and to apply for a loan. The eight weeks then would go forward past the June 30th timeline um, and you could use eligible expenses within that eight week period for loan forgiveness and then you could use any additional um, funding that you have left over if there is any uh, for the duration of your loan term but you have to sign up for the program by june 30th that is the end date um, for the paychecks protection program loans and we have eligibility here again, both are under 500 employees um, for the PPPL loan program. There is some accommodation for larger businesses, um, but still have to meet the SBA size standard. Um, so you can, you can find that on the SBA site. And then there are some accommodations for uh, food service um, industry uh, NAICS code 72, where it's 500 or fewer per location. But then again, all of these, both programs are available to sole proprietors, independent contractors, and those who are self-employed. So they both can participate. Um, just a note for the PPPL program, the window of accepting applications for employers and to sole proprietors uh, the window started uh, April 3rd on Friday. You can go to a participating bank and apply for that loan. For independent contractors and other self-employed individuals, that window is open April 10th. So on Friday, independent contractors and uh, other self-employed can apply for a loan through a participating bank. And some guidance for the independent contractors for the PPAPL loan program, um, it will likely be a bank case by case basis about what they're going to require for documentation as far as earnings over the past year. So there isn't kind of official guidance from Treasury or the SBA on what documents are needed for independent contractors and the self-employed. Um, so banks will likely determine what they think is necessary to best establish um, the 2.5% payroll costs for uh, those uh, groups of business owners. And again, the maximum loan size for the EIDL is $2 million. And applicants who apply for that loan can also apply for the emergency grant of up to $10,000. And that's connected through the application process. But again, you do get the emergency loan regardless of if you are, um, regardless of the outcome of the actual loan. So you can be denied for the actual loan, but still receive the $10,000 grant. And then for the PPAPL, it's the 2.5% of average monthly payroll costs uh, over the last 12 months. Um, there was a bit of confusion, I know, for some, from some small business owners that we've heard, is you know it's 2.5% times average monthly payroll costs, you know, if you're including that you can use some of the proceeds for utilities and rents um, and mortgage interest, you know, how do you include that payroll or those costs into the max loan amount? 
they, they've adjusted it so the 0.5 of the 2.5 is the amount that's supposed to be allocated for those other expenses. So the max loan amount is 2.5 times average monthly payroll, and that is what's available to use for all of those qualifying expenses. And again, the max loan amount for that program is $10 million. And the difference between the, the term duration um, for the SBA loan, for the EIDL, it's 30 years. For the new PPPL loan, it's two years. Um, both are low interest loans, 3.75% um, uh, for the SBA facilitated loan and 1% for all borrowers for the PPPL loan. And it also gives the forgiveness parameters. One um, note I should bring up is that you can apply for both of these loan programs. Both are available to small business owners. There is a bit of a complication if you've used the EIDL loan, if you've already um, applied for that loan and received funding for that loan, and you've applied, um, and you've used that loan for payroll purposes. If you've received the loan before April 3rd, you can refinance that loan into the more generous terms of the PPPL loan. So you can refinance that loan and that would be through your bank that is participating in the PPPL loan program. And if you're using it for payroll purposes and you also uh, apply for the PPPL, actually you have to refinance so that the two don't overlap. So the stipulation for having both loans is you can't use the loans for the same expenses. So if you're using one loan for payroll, you can't use the other, in which case you would only be using the PPPL loan for payroll purposes, and you could use the EIDL loan for other purposes, other fixed debt obligations, for mortgage principal, if, if you need um, uh, financing for that. So you can separate the expenses and make sure that you have um, really good record keeping so that you can show the banks or the SBA if they ask for it afterwards um, to make sure you're in compliance. But you can have both loans, you just can't use them for the same expenses. You also can't use the forgivable portions of each loan program simultaneously. So you can't have forgivable expenses with the PPPL loan program. All, if you total up all those forgivable expenses um, and you've also taken advantage of the $10,000 cat or emergency advance on the EIDL program, uh, at the end of it, if you take out both and have both loan forgiveness components, you would just subtract $10,000 right off the top of the total forgivable expenses in that eight week window of the other loan program, you would take $10,000 right off the top and that's what you would be left with as far as forgivable um, expenses. So that's how they're dealing with not having people kind of double dip in these two loan programs. Um, so, but I just wanted to put that out there because I know we've had a lot of questions about that. And I know this is, you know, it gets pretty complicated quickly, um, but I wanted to make sure that you're aware that we do have this on our website in case you, it's more um, uh, visually helpful to look at the two programs and figure out which one's best for your purposes. Um, and then just some added information here, again, with availability, the EIDL loan program is available now. You can, um, you can apply for the loan program through the SBA site and check the box for the emergency advance. And then for the PPPL loan program, um, the window is open April 3rd. It opened up for small businesses and sole proprietors or small employers and sole proprietors. And April 10th, it is open and available for independent contractors and self-employed individuals. There is also the employee retention tax credit that is available for employers. And this is a credit that is available through 2020, through December 31st, 2020. And it is equal to 50% of wages up to $10,000 per worker. 
And so if you're not um, eligible for the PPPL program, say if you're a nonprofit and you're a 501c7 or 501c6, um, probably a 501c7, um, and you aren't eligible for that program, this might be a helpful uh, tax credit for your purposes that you can take advantage of. So there are other accommodations that are available um, if you're not, if you don't qualify for, for the PPPL program. And the tax credit can be claimed against quarterly payroll taxes. And then also another loan that I thought I'd um, just bring up that's available to small business owners is the express bridge loan up to $25,000. So this can be um, you know, a helpful bridge for those in need of, um, of immediate financial assistance. And you can find a lender for the bridge loan by uh, contacting your local SBA office. And then there's additional information and I believe my, the presentation will be available to you. And um, there are some helpful links here that, um, that provide more information about the SBA loan, uh, the PPPL loan fact sheet that's posted at um, the Treasury Department's website. And it offers a lot of helpful guidance about frequently asked questions, but also their guidance as far as what borrowers should expect, um, much of which I went through, um, but they do have a posting of that there. And then also, because we didn't go over and we'll, um, I believe the next uh, webinar next week will go over some of these paid leave mandates and unemployment insurance information, also state unemployment insurance programs. Um, that might be of interest that you can look on these websites. The Department of Labor has some pretty helpful uh, frequently asked questions and information for small employers about what's required of them related to the paid leave mandates, the sick leave, and also the expanded FMLA that are both um, required of small business owners under 500 employees. And they are just requirements for businesses under 500 employees. Those over 500 employees don't have to comply with these two new paid leave mandates. Um, but in, in, information can be found there, um, but will also be covered covered in uh, the next webinar. And with that, I will stop. Um, hopefully, I know that was a lot of information. Um, hopefully, we can uh, ask or answer some more detailed questions that you have. Um, but thank you very much. And we can turn it over to the Q&A part. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. I uh, appreciate it. We did get a few, few and Questions come in. I did answer a few as they come in, but at some I I, I will ask you to see um, if you have a, a response for them. The first one is I understand. I think they meant the, the Small Business Association, not the Department of Labor. Will be using the ninety percent rule to determine if PPL loan will be converted to a grant. How will that ninety percent employee level be calculated? Consider employees are voluntary taken off or not returning to work. Sure. So there is this um, rule that if you, so you, the two and a half times um, the previous 12 month payroll. So you have, the, that's the max loan that you can have. And if you reduced employment in the time frame of February 15th, through April 26, if you reduced employment during that window, there will be a reduction in, there's a, a calculation for reducing the forgiveness element of payroll costs. So your forgivable amount will be reduced if you reduced employment in the window of February 15th to April 26. However, there is a rehiring um, component to this that if you rehire back 
to the pre-crisis level of staff that you had by June 30th, then you are eligible for full forgiveness within that eight week window. So during the eight weeks, if you can, um, if you can increase back to increase employment back to pre-crisis level, pre uh, February 15th, you can take advantage of full forgiveness of those qualifying expenses within that eight week window. If you aren't able to, um, to manage staffing up within that eight week window, you do have until June 30th to do that. And then I would suggest that if that is a possibility that you wouldn't submit for forgiveness for those expenses until after June 30th so that you have an opportunity to increase. But that's certainly a challenge for a lot of folks um, to get staffing back because we were at, you know, High, un high employment levels pre-February 15th, and you know, most businesses have had to reduce staff. Um, so it's certain, we certainly uh, understand that it's a challenge. We're talking to the SBA about maybe how we can make that a bit more flexible. Um, so that more small business owners can take advantage of the forgiveness element of it. But if you reduce staff and you can't get back up, then there will be a reduction in the forgiveness component. Um, I will also note that the, you know, rehiring, you don't have to rehire the same people. So that was a concern because many small business owners were saying that obviously they have reduced staff and those who um, were laid off have now uh, filed for unemployment insurance. And what happens then? Do they have to take off those same people from unemployment insurance and put them back on staff? Um, you don't, you just, they're just looking to increase levels of employment at the businesses for this loan forgiveness back to the levels pre-crisis. And so it doesn't have to be the same people um, going forward. And then there is also a reduction in salary. So if you reduce salary of more than 25%, um, in this window again of the April 15th, or sorry, February 15th to April 26th, if you reduce salaries by more than 25%, you have to increase salaries back up to those levels or else the forgiveness uh, total will be reduced. Um, so there are two, uh, two kind of uh, qualifications. You need to rehire and you need to get salaries back up if they went below 25% of last year's salary. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one, uh, and this is, uh, I have not heard of any of our owners uh, receiving uh, the funds yet, but have you heard of any of the businesses receiving their 10,000 uh, advance? No, so in the law, it said that the 10,000 advance would be, um, would be sent within three days. That has certainly not happened. We have not heard of one member um, that has received the $10,000. We have heard that SBA has said that the $10,000 advance should be, um, should be delivered or you know, deposited um, next week. And so the, you know, they were, they were a, very ambitious with this and unfortunately caused a lot of frustration with small business owners wanting to take advantage of this because of the circumstances that they're in, in, in getting this financial support quickly. But we haven't heard anything, but the Small Business Administration today said that that will um, hopefully be resolved as of um, as of next week, that people should be seeing those $10,000 advances. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question, um, if we have not already recalled or hired our seasonal staff or required to do that and put them back on payroll, even though there may, no, may be no work for them at this time? Yes, so that's been a question. Um, we have a bit more understanding of that and you can rehire for that eight week period and staff up even though you don't have work for them 
So you can pay them um, the salaries that you were paying last year using the loans without having with the reduced work. So, you know, they're looking to the goal of this program was to connect to keep the connection of employer and employee um, to keep that connection. So, you know, under the circumstances of many um, golf courses, restaurants, um, you know, those who have had to temporarily close because of orders, state orders, um, you can use this loan and pay workers that are on payroll and bring them back on payroll and pay them even if there is no work to be done. So they can stay home and be paid or just as long as they're on the payroll or you can assign exactly. them other duties. That yes, you know, and it is the hope that when they developed this program, um, you know, it was under kind of the assumption since, it was, you know, every day seems like 10 years now, um, but way back when it was under the assumption that this disruption would likely not last past two months. And so that's why they created this eight week period that they thought would be sufficient um, for, for getting the economy back um, up and running. Obviously, that's not going to be the case for many. And so now it, people are kind of stuck in this situation that at the time of loan origination, you start the eight weeks going forward and you might not still be up and running, um, but the rehiring is still a provision so that you can get the loan forgiveness, the total loan forgiveness. And so you can pay um, employees that are on payroll through this loan um, basically to not work. Okay, good. Uh, the next one is you've answered it. Uh, it's coming to us a little different. This is seasonal uh, employer. Uh, the eight week window versus the, the, the February 15th through 6th, June 30th window. Not sure how to calculate which is used to calculate the use of the funds. Is it when we open, perhaps May 5th through June 30th, or eight weeks from May 5th? from the expenses since uh, February 15th? Sure, so when you receive the loan at loan origination, whenever that is, it is eight weeks from then forward. That would be the window for eligible forgiveness expenses. Um, you know, it's now hopefully there's a little bit more flexibility for business owners to be able to time it. So when they do um, need the loans, there will be enough money in the program. So you could wait. Um, you know, I don't know how fast, uh, you know, the demand will kind of outstrip the program funding. You know, we've heard from Secretary Mnuchin that you know, there will be enough money, don't worry, but you know, Congress has to allocate the money. So they are allocating more money to the program um, that we heard uh, updates today about that. Um, and I believe it was, you know, 200 billion more, but you know, the win, there's only a finite amount of money available for this program. You know, it might be the case that you take advantage of the program and again, um, you know, pay people for this eight week period that doesn't include being up and running as far as your business. If, you know, if you want to use it that way to take advantage of it, or, you know, it might be, um, you know, it might be worth it to wait and see um, how much, you know, kind of funding is still left in the program to where it makes sense for your business that you're opening May 3rd. And that would be when you would, um, you know, most uh, be able to take advantage of it. Um, so unfortunately, that's just a judgment call. And, you know, we certainly appreciate the, the kind of uh, decision making process for many small business owners having to uh, make those calls that there's a lot of or a lot of uncertainty going forward. Um, but you can use, you know, you can use the loan and, and have people back on payroll and not be up and running, um, or you can, you know, wait until you are and, and, you know, make sure that you're kind of following the um, amount of financing left for this program. Um, and, you know, 
they've said that it will be it will be fully funded for the demand out there. Um, we certainly hope so. Okay, um, thank you. The next question is kind of a uh, uh, again it covers a number of different people, but um, not just a seasonal, but a number of our golf courses have been closed uh, due to the, the uh, local state regulations and laws. Yeah. Um, for those who are um, closed but still have just a few people on their payroll, um, should they also go ahead and, for, and submit for the PPO? PPP, I'm sorry. Sure. So, um, if if seventy five, so it's it's interesting because if seventy five, if you use it just as a low interest loan, and you know you the eight week window, you're not going to rehire back up, or you could rehire back up a little bit, but you're going to have a reduced forgiveness within that eight week window. You can certainly use the loan as just a low interest loan, but you still have to use the um, the money seventy five percent allocated to uh, payroll costs and 25% can be used for other expenses. So that, um, you know, the 75-25 is for the loan regardless of its, if it's in the window. Um, but, and you know, it'll be a 1% two year term loan with a six month deferment, which, you know, certainly could be attractive for, for many people. Um, so you can certainly use it uh, in that way too. Yeah, the, what's, I guess that the question, follow-up question I would have on that one, uh, the hard part for them is uh, the eight-week window yes. um, because uh, the, the eight weeks begins once their uh, loan is approved. Yes. And uh, so we, we, uh, the eight weeks following that, they may still not be open. So taking advantage of any uh, increase in expenses because the state hasn't allowed it to open still is not going to help them much. No. And this is one of the elements that's caused a lot of frustration um, from small business owners that we've talked to, certainly, that they're wondering, you know, what's the point if we're not up and running and the window for this ends June 30th? or that the money for the program runs out and I won't be able to uh, apply and access a loan. Um, you know, unfortunately that's a judgment call um, to you know, see if it's worth waiting or if it's worth taking out now. We're certainly hopeful that this program will be funded throughout the duration um, of the program period that ends June 30th. Um, but, you know, we don't have certainty on that. Um, so that, you know, that is the tricky part of this is if you wait, how long you wait um, to get back up to being operational and still being able to access the loan. But wouldn't you agree that they should also um, apply for the EIDLs? Yes. So the two... Um, we've recommended to small business owners, um, you know, certainly worth applying for both loans if that makes sense for your business to do that. Since you can, as long as you don't use them for overlapping expenses and you understand that you can't overlap the forgiveness provisions in both programs, um, then yes, you know, applying for both uh, would probably make sense for many. Um, if you have more other expenses that uh, you need help paying, the, the EIDL is more flexible in what you can spend the money on. So that might be helpful for some businesses out there where it might not you know, work as well, the PPL that is 75% having to go to payroll. Um, so if you have more expenses that are other, other expenses or say you want to use it for mortgage principal, um, the idle loan would probably be your best bet. If most of your expenses are payroll related, then the PPL is probably the best loan product for you. Okay, the next question, we got, got a couple more, but I'll try to wrap it up. Um, I think this has to do with the affiliation rule. 
uh, or test on the certification of a business representative. Um, what is the what is the standard requirement to certify that? For the affiliation, it's yes. um, providing the documents to the bank so that they can go through. It's basically making sure that. Um, you know, the control of the business is of the borrower with the borrower. Um, and so you just have to provide documentation. It's going to be kind of bank by bank, um, you know, how much they uh, require as far as uh, paperwork on that. Um, but you will have to, you know, uh, provide some information related to that. And then on um, the the 20% or more ownership, you have to list everybody on the application that has more than 20% ownership of the business and provide that to the bank who's facilitating your loan. Okay. Um. I think that's the only other one I think would be, um, we did get a comment from one of our listeners. Uh, they did receive approval from the bank and wanted to know uh, because the governor still has the businesses closed, does the eight week period start below before they allow us to, the employees to own the property? Again, that goes back to uh, they're forced to be closed, but uh, they have employees. So they should bring them back on payroll, but not work them. Yes, so as it is now um, in statute, the eight weeks starts at loan origination and it's eight weeks going forward that you have to um, pay employees, bring them back on payroll, pay them to have the full amount forgiven even if you're not operational. Um, you know, the SBA is putting out more guidance on this on this front. Um, so we are certainly hoping that they can, you know, that there is room to broaden this or to move the origination date forward a little bit um, for those who make sense to do so. But right now, as it is, um, it is when you receive the loan or loan origination, eight weeks forward, that's the window that you have to spend your loan, um, the eight week window uh, you have to spend your loan on qualifying forgivable expenses to take advantage of that part of the loan. Even if that period falls outside of June 30th? Even if that falls outside June 30th. So you, the disadvantage of going up to June 30th is that if you are in the eight week window, you have to be up to pre-crisis staffing levels because the staffing level um, rehire ends June 30th. So if you took out a loan June 29th and you have the eight weeks going forward and that's your window for forgivable expenses, you have to be rehired to pre-crisis levels as of June 30th. So you have to be, you don't have room um, to rehire, to get the full loan forgiveness, basically after you have, you know, after loan origination, you have to kind of be there at the beginning because that rehire period ends June 30th. Okay. All right. Well, that's all we can, all the questions we can uh, answer today. As I said before, if we didn't get to your questions and uh, weren't able to answer and it wasn't part of Holly's presentation, you can email me send it to, to our go to my site and website and you'll find our miles at ngca.org and uh, holly i want to thank you so much for giving us your time today and your expertise has been very informative and i appreciate it my pleasure good, goodbye to everyone and thank you and i look forward to seeing you next week